So, um, you like this girl, huh? What? No, no, this is my fiancé's house. Right. This is the story of a boy. You stalking her, are you? And the girl who once loved him. I think she's cheating on me. Well, that definitely sounds suspicious. The cabbie who says he can help him. The amount of extramarital intercourse I've seen happen in that back seat. And the thugs that are out to find him. The next time I won't be so friendly. I won't be friendly at all. I was trying to build the tension. But most of all, it's the story of a man. Sio Bohan. Sio Bohan. Sio Bohan. What sort of name is Sio Bohan? His name was Sio Bohan. A man named Sio Bohan. Never heard of him. At least I think it is. You forward? Tail job. Buckle up. Yeah. Seriously, put your belt on. I'm not allowed to oh, drive until you right. put your belt on. Yeah. Are you guys ordering any for you? Yes. When you love somebody, set them free. Then follow at a safe distance. Who is this guy? The Tail Job, coming soon. I don't want to be rude, but um, yeah. we're just having a girls' night, so, oh. yeah. I'm sorry. Hello. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for that great round of applause for the trailer. Um, so, my name's Brian Moses. I'm the uh, co-writer, co-director co-shooter, co-editor, co-sound recorder of The Tail Job. Um, this was a uh, pretty indie film, as you can probably tell by the list of jobs that I did on it, with uh, my very good friend Daniel Miller. So this film was um, born out of frustration, I guess, at uh, doing a lot of work, hard work for... Uh, I'm a... Uh, writer, director, I guess, uh, by trade as well as uh, when I'm doing it as a hobby for myself. Um, so Daniel and I do a lot of corporate work, commercial work for other people, often with low budgets, and we were both like really frustrated going, why are we working so hard for these little 30 second, one minute things, we should do it for ourselves. And we both happened to be free for about three months at the end of 2013. And he told me a story about a friend of his who had been like searching through his girlfriend's phone and got really angry and jealous because he saw these messages from some random guy called Sio Bohan who he thought might have been some Asian guy and he was so angry and jealous. And uh, when he told me that story, I cracked up. Like obviously his friend worked it out eventually because he confronted his girlfriend and there was a horrible fight that they had over it and I think they broke up not long after that. But uh, I cracked up and we were both laughing going, imagine if the guy didn't confront her and tried to follow her one night to see what happened and ended up getting into all sorts of trouble. And uh, we both went, maybe we could do that. And so we spent um, the three months... Uh, writing and then casting and then shooting the film. Um, and that's the end. So thanks for coming along. <laughs> we wrote the script uh, very quickly in about three weeks. Probably a little too quick, the first draft. Most of the first draft. Um, but we had a deadline because we knew a couple of the actors, the main actors we wanted to use in the film and they were leaving the country. So we kind of knew exactly when we had to start shooting and we thought we'd probably need about three weeks to make it originally 
because uh, we've made a lot of short films before, a lot of Trop Fest films. That's kind of how I started out getting into the industry was making short films for Trop Fest, probably like a lot of people here. And, uh, you know, when you make a seven-minute short film, you can pretty much get it in one day, two days. So we sort of worked it out and went, you know what, we can probably do a 90-minute film in about three weeks if we work really hard. And three weeks turned into about three months. Not full-time, mind you, but... Yeah, so we wrote the script in about three weeks. It came together really quickly. So Dan and I had this deadline when we knew we had to start shooting and that kind of focused us and we worked really well together just sort of fleshing out the story, the main plot points and then he would take a scene, we'd break up the scenes, he'd take a scene, I'd take a scene and we had this sort of very friendly rivalry going on where he would send a scene to me and it was really funny. I thought it was really funny. I'd be like, oh, God damn it, I've got to write one funnier than him just so he's... J jealous and angry uh, so we had this great competition going so the script came together super fast um, I don't know it was just like we were really focused and then we had about two weeks to do our pre-production and while we were doing pre-production we were still kind of writing the script as well like tweaking it a little bit and then the cast are a lot of them are people we already know because we've been working in the industry for so long I started out as an actor I studied acting at university so quite a few of the cast were people I went to university with or knew who had done the same course as me. Um, and then people we've just met along the way. Uh, and then there's a couple of like cameos from some not super famous dudes, but some guys who have been around for a while, some older actors, a guy called Gary Waddell, who was in Chopper as the guy that chopped off Chopper's ear in that film. And he's done like a string of films. Like he's one of those guys that's in just about every classic Australian film, but you don't know his name. He's just always a solid character actor with a great face. And another guy called uh, Grant, uh, Grant Dodwell, who some of you may know from a country practice back in the day. Uh, he doesn't do a lot of acting anymore, but we got him out of retirement for our film, so that was fun. When we wrote the script, because we knew we were doing it all ourselves, we had pretty much no crew most of the time. So it was me and Dan shooting and lighting and doing the sound and everything so our whole philosophy was make something as awesome as we possibly can with the least amount of money we can possibly spend so those were our two kind of guiding philosophies um and so part of making or not spending money is you know limiting your cast and crew uh, not that anyone was getting paid anyway, everyone was doing it for the love of it, but it's, you have to cater, you have to feed people. So the less people there are around, the less food you're feeding them, and the quicker you can move. Because the more people you've got on set, the things just slow down. And so we didn't want to, we just didn't want to be slowed down. We had to keep shoot, keep shooting, keep shooting was our motto. Um, so. We crewed it all. At the start, we had a couple of extra crew members uh, who would help out. And every now and then, we'd be able to wrangle someone who would hold a boom for us, which was awesome. But we never let that stop us. If we couldn't get someone, we'd just do it ourselves. We'd, you know, rig the guys up with uh, microphones. So the, the film is, uh, has two people as the main characters. And they're in just about every scene. So one of the things with, that we liked about the idea that we came up with for doing it ourselves was what we thought was the simple idea of two guys in a taxi. That's it. There's no set. There's no problems. We're outside. Wherever they are with the taxi, we're, we're happy. We're, we're ready to go. Um, and it's sort of got a bit of a detective noir structure in that these two guys, they go, they find, they're trying to find a clue to get back to the fiancé. So they'll meet a character they do a scene with that character, that character at the end of the scene or at some point gives them a clue which sends them on to the next part of the story and then they meet another character and that character, the first character, we never see again. And so we had this awesome ability to uh, be able to just like get a cast member, an actor in, they were only needed for one night, we'd do the scene and then that's it, they were wrapped and we, they didn't have to like schedule around work and all that sort of stuff. So it was only our two main actors who we had to like work around in terms of their schedule uh so that was cool so that was one thing we thought oh that'll make it real easy but of course our two main actors they had to work during the day they had to earn money so it did end up 
blowing out. And the other thing we didn't quite anticipate was uh, actors get sleepy when they're when they're working during the day. As directors, we don't care. We can go all night. We don't care. But uh, actors, they're precious and they need sleep. And it's a good thing that they get sleep because they're on camera and they should get sleep. Uh, so it was actually, you know, we'd find the first night, a couple of nights, we tried going to like three, four in the morning and the performances were just so like, you know, it's, as you could see from the trailer, it's supposed to be a, a fun, high-energy action comedy and they'd be, you know, they'd just be falling asleep halfway through lines <laughs> and it didn't work. So for us and for them, most nights we had to cut, like midnight was pretty much when they'd start to get sleepy. You could kind of push to one and then that was it. Um, and I think probably our catering didn't help either. It was like a steady diet of pizza and Alan's snakes. And so just that, that fat, the fat and sugar high would be great for a couple of hours and then you'd have the, the sugar crash and that was it. It was all over. So that's why the shoot went for so long. Uh, and then it took us about nine months to cut it together. Again, not full time. So Dan and I shared the, the editing as well. And, you know, by the time we started editing, we had to go back to work. And so then we just had to fit it in around our schedule. So about nine months to do the, the editing, plus the, doing the score and the sound mix and all that stuff. And then eventually we spent, well, we spent like 12 months after it was finished and done entering festivals and got rejected from just about everyone over 12 months uh, until Slamdance came along. So Sundance was our first one. We really wanted to try and get Sundance. We missed out on that. And Slamdance and Sundance are on at exactly the same time. So we should have just entered them both at the same time at the start of the year, but we didn't. We were too arrogant. We thought we'd get into sl Sundance, we wouldn't need slam dance. So 12 months came around, we finally got into slam dance, which was cool. So I can probably talk about that more if people want. And then we got into one other festival, the Kate Film Festival in Santa Monica, where we won a prize, which was really cool. So we've done those two festivals. And then since then, we've been plugging at ourselves around Australia through Fan Force, which some of you, all of you are probably aware of. Uh, it's a you know, self-distribution platform where you get to book in a cinema screening at a uh, city and cinema of your choice. And then Fan Force uh, handle all the ticket sales and then you handle all the marketing and basically get all your friends and family to come along and uh, buy tickets. And uh, so that's what's happening at the moment with my movie. That was a long ramble. Sorry about that. Slam Dance was fantastic because Slam Dance is a pretty cool festival. That's a festival for first time feature film directors with films under a million dollars, which ours is well and truly. Our film cost uh, us $23,000 to make, which was uh, a lot of money for us because it was self funded, but it's not a lot of money to make a movie. So we we're pretty happy with that. Uh, again, that was part of our, you know, philosophy, spend as little as possible. Most of that went on vehicles, on cars. So we bought a taxi, we bought a van. Um, and then the score went on the score, went on the sound mix, and went on pizza and Alan's snakes. Uh, plus a few other incidental things. Uh, so, but Slam Dance, so Slam Dance was fantastic. It was a really great festival. They're really supportive um, before the festival, they had like a big Skype session with all of the filmmakers to talk about what the process would be, uh, how to use Slam Dance as a launch pad for your film and your career. Um, and there was a lot of interest. We found there was a lot of interest, particularly in America, uh, for the films that were at Slam Dance. But it's a weird festival in that no one goes to Slam Dance except the filmmakers. But the industry is talking about the festival. Everyone wants to see the films that are at the festival. They just don't want to actually go to the festival. So we had this thing where we found out afterwards our DVD, because they asked us to you know, submit a whole bunch of DVDs. So we heard from various people that our DVDs were circulating around Los Angeles. And I got contacted by a couple of uh, agencies after the festival who wanted to, to have a chat and, you know, we were, you know, they said, oh, you guys are one of the talked about films. Everyone's, you know, checking this film out. We heard it was, it landed on someone's desk at Michael Bay's production company, which was really cool. 
But again, not, you know, nothing came of it, but it was nice that people were watching the movie. Um, and that's kind of what it was. It was like this little bit of buzz around it, but, um, you know, no one wanted to sign. There, Everyone was basically, hey, it's a great film. We love it. Uh, stay in touch. Stay in contact. Keep going. It's like, hey, can, you help, can you help me keep going? <laughs> no, we can't. Sorry, not this time. We're not ready for you, but, you know, keep going. We're watching. It's like, all right. Thank you. <laughs> and they love it. And some really cool directors have come through Slam Dance. So Christopher Nolan uh, came through Slam Dance. Um, who else? Uh, Napoleon Dynamite, that film that came through Slam Dance. Uh, it was someone else as well. I can't remember. Look at it. It's on Wikipedia. Hi, my name's Andrew. Um, you mentioned that you edited the film yourself. I was just wondering, in your experience, did you have any kind of thoughts or suggestions about how to best edit comedy scenes? Uh, yes, I guess. Don't make them too long. Make sure the timing's really good. Cut them sh sharp. Make them sharp. Uh, the worst thing is watching a comedy scene that, you know, falls flat or there's too many gaps or too many dramatic pauses. Yeah. Sh be, be, be hard on yourself and just go, can this be shorter? Can this be faster? And show it to people. Show it to people, and if they don't laugh, it's, you know, recut. Recut. Um, yeah, it's just test screenings is the best thing you can do, especially if, you know, they're not necessarily that close to you either. Show it to random people. Um, yeah, that's the thing. But also, you know, I'm going to say the complete opposite of that as well, which is, you know, you've got your own sense of humour, you know what you find funny. Try not to let other people tell you what they think is funny. So, you know, it's a balance, I guess, of knowing, you know, you'll have a particular audience that'll find whatever you think is hilarious, hilarious. So just go with that. Be, you know, true to your own comic sensibilities. So this evening you alluded to various core skills for making it, getting a film actually across the line that might seem obvious in hindsight, you know wearing multiple hats, cutting as well as, and so forth. Knowing people from your acting school days and so forth, uh, uh, the ethos of just keep shooting and so forth. Would you dare to rank them for people who are starting from scratch? And also, would you comment on the role of nights like this evening? Um, so you want my personal order of what's most important to get a film done? Utterly essential. Oh man, how do you how do you rank them? I don't know. I mean, obviously, just don't stop shooting. I guess that's the first thing. If you want to get a film done, don't stop shooting. Uh, compromise, find solutions is part of that. So you go in with an idea, obviously, and always on a film set. In my experience, anyway, stuff never goes exactly according to plan. So you kind of have to know when to let go of that original vision and veer and find something that's quite possibly even better. Uh, I think that's the main thing that no one knows what you had in your head originally, so who cares? Just get it done the best you can. If it wasn't supposed to be raining and it's raining, go, all right, well, it's raining in this scene now. Um, obviously, you're not always going to be able to do that, especially if you've shot something that's part of the same scene or the day before and it wasn't raining. But uh, uh, what else? I mean, that's I mean that's kind of the main thing. Plan, planning, planning is like a big part of it as well. I wish we had more time to plan. I think a crew of two, well, we kind of we had a crew of two plus we had one extra person uh, who was our producer, I guess, um, who an actor who was also in the film. Well, yeah, she was our producer, but she wasn't. No, 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 she wasn't strictly a producer is what I mean. She was our producer, but she was also our production manager. She was also doing our casting. She was also running out and getting catering. She was also, yeah, that's also a producer, I guess, but also everything else. Um, yeah, and she was an actor in the film as well. Uh, so, she's a producer, I guess. Hi, my name's Nick. Hi, Nick. I uh, just want to 
give you congrats for getting it all done in three months. I just am blown away by that. That's amazing. It was yeah, it was like fifty six shoot shoot days. Jesus. And you so you said you put the script together in three weeks. Yeah. And I'm just wondering whether that document stayed intact during the shoot or because everything was so hectic during the shoot it was more organic and you were throwing scenes in as you went along? Would you have an example of how the script might have changed during such a frenetic production period? Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, the, the script was... Because it's, uh, it's, a, it's a farce, it's an action comedy, there's, there's cause and effect. Uh, so there's very specific things that needed to happen in the script in order for the story to work out and plot out at the end. But... Where we did have some looseness, I guess, was uh, allowing additions either, you know, by us at the time or by the cast because uh, we cast a lot of comedians and just generally generally funny actors. Uh, we were super happy for them to add because the script was written so quickly. Uh, there were holes and there were, you know, things that weren't as funny as they could be. So we were really encouraged our actors to just bring your own... Uh, ideas about your character to the scene. Craig and Blair, who are our two lead actors, they would have like a little rehearsal themselves while we were setting up for each scene. We basically did a scene a night. Um, and they would come up with their own lines and additions and stuff. And most of the time we'd go, yep, that's hilarious, that's great, let's do that as well. So we loved that. We loved the actors bringing their own ideas. Uh, that helped us a lot. The other tip, the other clue is uh, for someone who asked, if you're going to shoot at night time, uh, choose locations that are 90% lit by Sydney Council. <laughs> because we learned very early on you cannot light an entire street with four battery-operated LED lights. <laughs> Does not work. It's not going to happen. Actually, I've got a clip. Do you want to see a clip at all? All right, this clip, I hate this clip. I hate this part of the movie. This is the one, one of the bits I re... Is it this one? Oh, no, no, this is a better one, actually. All right, so stunt scenes. This is... Um, so we did all our own stunts. It's an action film. This is the other part of the film. It's like, oh, I wish we had more cash because the stunts were far more intricately written in the script than they ended up on the screen because we didn't have any stunt people. So... You're going to see a taste of kind of... The humour is like partly... It's comedy with heart and there's also a bit of sort of action and violence that goes on as well. So this two scenes is kind of... It gives you a good taste of what the movie is and what it looked like and how we shot it with just a couple of battery-operated LEDs and 90% Sydney lighting and no stunt people. So uh, this scene, what you're about to see is the guys have got a tracker, they've got a phone tracker, and they're tracking this guy called Sio Bohan, who they think is with a fiancé. They've already had, the reason they're lost is because they've had a run-in, a road rage incident with a guy, and they're about to run into that road rage guy again. He's like the nemesis of the film. Um, and... I think that's all you need to know. Oh, and the stunt, the stunt guy, the nemesis, the psycho guy is the co-director, Daniel Miller. So we cast wide. I think the main thing that I want to do next time is get a budget. <laughs> next time, get a budget. Um, yeah, I think it just it would be nice to be able to spend money the way, you know, make something exactly how you want to make it or more or less. Uh, and also, I think casting. I think next time I'd work harder to get a an actor. All our actors are awesome, and I'm super happy with you know the performances we got. But the biggest thing we've had with ter in terms of like trying to sell the film or get the film into festivals, everyone just wants to know who's in the movie. Uh, so I'd work really hard to try and get at least one actor of some renown that people love, that people would be happy to like market the film, to see the film. That's the biggest thing for me, would be just get someone famous in it. Okay, so it was shot on a 5D and a 7D. So, because um, Dan and I were shooting, we wanted to like do multicam so we could get through shots because it's a comedy, you know what I mean? Like, 
we wanted to be able to, you know, cut fast between characters so we could, you know, speed up the dialogue or slow it down or whatever. So we basically, you know, cross shot uh, with a 5D and a 7D. Mostly on the, the 50 was our, like, hero lens. We loved the 50 mil lens because low light, you know, 51.4. Uh, so shooting out in Sydney Council lit scenes, that was just great to be able to open it right up. It made following focus tricky and there's, you know, there's quite a few moments in there where we don't, quite land the focus pull but you know it's fine because the shot moves on pretty quick anyway so we we're happy to live with that uh, and yeah and then just a couple of sennheiser radio mics zoom h4n yeah the self-doubt i'll tell you what for me what motivates me is being out of pocket anytime there was self-doubt i'm like oh but you've just spent seven thousand dollars on two cars you have to keep shooting this. I, don't, I hate wasting money. I hate it. I hate it. So that was it. That was it for me. And plus also, you know, once you've got everyone involved, it was the same as the Zealous uh, crew said, like once everyone's involved, like you feel like there's a whole lot of people you're going to let down. And also for myself, I was like, man, I just want to finish this feature film. I wanted to do my first feature film before I turned 40. So I did it. Uh, that was a big motivator too. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. You too can do it. Uh, and what was the other one? Oh, worst night of filming. Okay, I'll tell you the worst night of filming. We, uh, we had a phone booth scene that actually got cut from the film, so the whole story is even more terrible in a way. But um, we had this scene where they're in a phone booth and they're trying to make a phone call and it was real like funny bounce bounce scene and we'd gotten all the way to the end we just had to pick up a close-up of nicholas and this drunk guy comes up from the pub i don't know which pub we were in newtown and he goes you guys aren't meant to be filming here and we're like yes yes we are we're allowed to film here it's okay he goes show us your permit it's like, how, does this, how does this drunk guy know about film permits it's like Mate, just leave it alone. It's fine. Like, we're not hurting anyone. It's like, mate, this is my neighborhood. You're not meant to film here. Fuck off. I'm like, come on, mate. He's like, and he started insulting us. Like, just one by one. Just went around and like, just, you know, look at this guy. He's so fat. You're fat, mate. Why don't you go eat another burger, mate? That was for Craig, obviously, the taxi driver. <laughs> and then, look at this guy. You think you're good looking, do you? You think you're good looking? Oh, it's such a good looking guy in a movie. Oh, it's like, oh, what the hell is going on? So that went on for about like half an hour with this guy. And eventually we're like, guys, let's just go. Let's just pack up and go. And he stood over our gear and then it goes, I'm calling the cops. You're not meant to be here. I'm like, just give us our gear, mate. We're just going. He's like, nah, I'm calling the cops. And Craig, uh, tra who played Trevor, the taxi driver, had had enough of the insults by this point and the, the, his inner action hero came out and... Uh, and he uh, pushed the guy. He pushed the guy. He went up and went, fuck you, man. I'm not fat. And he pushed the guy. And then the guy fell over. The guy fell over onto the street. He might have hit his head. I don't know. And the guy starts screaming, help, help. Call the police. I'm being attacked. Help. Anyway, he wasn't standing over our gear anymore. So we grabbed the gear and we shoved it into the taxi. And we sped off. And I don't know what happened to that guy at the end. I don't know what happened to that guy. But uh, Craig, as a great defense, Craig's line was when the guy started screaming out, he's like, oh, because neighbors started looking out at this point. There's people like looking around at us. He's like, everyone saw the drunk guy fall over, didn't they? Everyone saw the drunk guy fall over. And we used that line in the film. So it did actually, it ended up being, you know, a nice thing that happened, I guess, because, yeah. There's a scene where he, Craig gets beaten up by a security guard. And uh, the security guard says, everyone saw the drunk guy fall over. So, you know, that was nice. That was our worst night. That was shit.